First Timothy chapter 6. I know that this portion of the epistle would not be considered the most exciting portion of this epistle or of Scripture perhaps, but nevertheless, this is as much the Word of God as any other portion of Scripture. And therefore, it is incumbent upon us to listen and to get from these Scriptures all that God has for us. Um, there are a number of ways that we could approach the couple of verses that we'll be looking at. And uh, brother, could you turn this down a little bit? It's, to me, it's too loud and it's affecting me. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Let as many servants, slaves, bond servants, as are under the yoke, count their own masters worthy of all honor, that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, the masters, because they are brethren, but, contrast here, rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit, these things teach and exhort. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not a theory about how to get to heaven when you die. That's the way far too many think when they think of the gospel. As we saw, or at least began to see in the first hour today, the gospel is really the power of God unto salvation, uh, unto salvation that begins in this life and ends, well it doesn't end, it continues into eternity. And it's to everyone who believes or those who, whose lives are characterized by believing. It, it involves a new perspective upon this life in light of that which is to come. That's what happens when the gospel gets a hold of you in truth and power. It changes your vantage point. It shifts your paradigm. You begin to see everything differently. It doesn't matter what your economic or your social status is in a culture, whether this one or the one in which Paul is writing to, in the New Testament, the gospel will affect how you live. It doesn't matter if it's in the United States of America, or whether it's in Iran, or whether it's in Israel, or Russia, or wherever. It will change you. And you will then adapt to that culture based upon the truth that God gives to you in His Word. Work. That is a major part of our lives. And I'm talking here about employment. Like every other part of our lives, we are to be the kind of employee and employer that commends our God and His doctrine to the world. So with that statement, you know where we're going here eventually in this message. It's going to take a few minutes to get there. But when, I, when that thought came to my mind, I immediately uh, raced back to some Old Testament examples like Joseph and like Daniel. You know Joseph's boss and Daniel's boss knew who their boss was? Joseph's boss and Daniel's boss wasn't their earthly boss. It was their heavenly king. It was the Lord God. It was Jehovah. And they lived their lives out in such a way that that was very apparent. That they trusted, not in their earthly oversight, but in their heavenly oversight. And that is really what Paul is driving at here in these two verses that we're looking at. That's what happens when the gospel gets a hold of you. You begin to see God differently. And then you begin to see those who are placed in authority over you in this life very, very differently. So he says, let as many servants 
as they're under the yoke. And here he's talking to believers. He's talking to saints. He's talking to those who have been born again of the Spirit of God. Who have this paradigm shift. They see things differently. He's saying, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. That the name of God... This is why he's saying what he's saying. In order that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed by the masters, unbelieving masters, and the culture that's looking on. And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren. But rather, because they are brethren, do them service. Because they're faithful and beloved. Partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Paul is addressing those in his day that made up a large port, a large part of the employment of that culture. They were called servants, slaves, bond servants. That's what the, ser the word servants translated, servants in the King James anyway. That's what the word refers to. It can refer to other forms of servitude, but here... It is that bondservant mindset, that slave mindset. And it is that servitude that is either by choice or force. By choice or by force. Because servant, servanthood could have been in that day entered into either by choice or by force. And it encompassed both of those. It is a relationship of bondage in which one was under an absolute authority. Translated master here, it's that Greek word despotes or despot. Not the other word kurios, which is also translated lord, which also has the idea of being a master. These bond servants that Paul is writing to in that culture held many positions and many ranks, often much more significant than a free man. It was a different environment than what you and I know, at least when we think of slavery. He says servants under the yoke. And it indicates the nature of the servitude and likely indicating a distinction from those in verse 2 when he says servants who are under the yoke. Likely he's referring to those who were under a relationship with unbelieving masters who especially were hard upon them. And then in verse 2, he's contrasting those who have believing masters. The question has been asked, and maybe when you read this, especially in light of much of the discussion that you may or may not be privy to in our day concerning slavery, why doesn't Paul simply say, slaves, run, flee your masters? It's wrong. Why doesn't he say, masters, yet you're, let your slaves go free? But he doesn't say that here, nor does he say that anywhere else. And there are multiple times where this subject is spoken of in the New Testament. And that has created an awful lot of consternation in the hearts of people, especially who are engaging with the secular community over these matters. Well, Paul has already addressed the matter of slavery as you and I are mostly accustomed to understanding it. He addressed it back in chapter 1. Do you remember that? In verse 10, when he's listing the violations against the law of God. Do you remember what he said? He gave an example. He called it in the King James. It's translated in chapter 1 in verse 10. Men stealers. Men stealers. Thayer is a Greek scholar. In his dictionary, this is the way he expresses this word men-stealers, a slave dealer, a kidnapper, a man-stealer, of one who unjustly reduces free men to slavery. Unjustly reduces free men 
to slavery of one who steals the slaves of others and sells them. Now that sounds very much like the African slave trade, uh, uh, slave trade that most of us are familiar with. And the scriptures clearly condemn slavery of that sort. But when you go back to the Old Testament law, servitude was regulated under Mosaic law. We're not going to go into this deeply. But it was regulated so that there was at least protection against abuse. The fact of the matter is, when nation conquered nation, there were oftentimes two choices. One, a total slaughter of the nation that was one gained victory over, or putting the conquered people in servitude. Israel was a nation that lived in that culture. And God gave laws to regulate this idea of servants. In Exodus chapter 21 and verse 16, God said this, And he that steals a man and sells him, or if he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. That's harsh. That's what God thought of man-stealing. Stealing somebody, another human being, and selling that human being as property to someone else. God condemns that. In the Gentile world, including the Roman culture, slavery formed a fundamental part of the social and economic system of that day. About one-third of the Roman population is estimated to have been enslaved. One-third of the Roman population. Either indentured slaves, that is those who, I guess we, should, we could say, sold themselves or entered into a covenant with someone that they owed money to and they gave themselves to work off that debt. It's called indentured slavery or servant servitude. Captives that we just mentioned a moment ago. There was voluntary and there was involuntary slavery or servitude. And when Paul wrote this letter, that was the culture of that day in the world. Not just in one nation, in the world. And so while slavery at best was still a harsh system, to immediately abolish it would have been chaotic socially and economically. I read an article in the uh, Ligonier website and I copy this statement. Slavery in the ancient Roman Empire was closer to the modern day employer-employee relationship. Not the slavery of other eras based on kidnapping and racism which scripture abhors. You've probably heard it before in your own employment situation, or perhaps if you're an employer, you've been accused of this, being a slave driver, or we work like slaves today. You know, we use that, those are expressions probably not acceptable to use because of the culturally, the, the, the way our culture has gone with words and language that are some things we just don't say like we once might have said. The fact of the matter is, to work like a slave, at least in the biblical sense, is to work in a godly way. At least as God says slavery should be. There are guidelines that God gives for work. And working hard and being diligent, we're going to read some of those scriptures, is that which God commends to us. And the problem is, in many cultures, including the culture in which we live, we're soft. And we think everybody deserves an air-conditioned office. Uh, we think of employment in a way that God never intended employment to be. And that there is a relationship of the one who is laboring and those for whom one labors. And it's pictured here in the scriptures as the servant-master relationship. In the Expositor's Bible Commentary, I read this, the sudden abolition of slavery in the first century 
would have meant the shipwreck of society. Neither master nor slave was fit for any such change. A long course of education was needed before so radical a reform could be successfully accomplished. And let me just pause to say this. And I hesitate with how much to say here. There have been notable Christians in history who were slaveholders. And I would contend unbiblically so. And I'm not going to use names here today, but I would say, if you read about that in history, do not defend those men who did it just because you theologically agree with them. If, it, if, it, if it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's sin, it's sin. It doesn't matter who did it. Thankfully, there were those men that we appreciate in, biblical, in Christian history who stood against slavery. In fact, C.H. Spurgeon, I read, some of his sermons were burned in the United States because he called out slaveholders. Interesting. Thank you, C.H. Spurgeon. He's gone, I know. But I appreciate that. He stood against a sin of his day. John Wesley did the same. John Newton did the same. John Newton was a slaveholder, a slave trader, not just a holder. He, he engaged in the, in, the, in the trade of slaves till God saved him and changed him. And he, along with William Wilberforce, were movers in their day to change and lead to the abolition of slavery, of the slave trade in England in 1833 and then eventually the United States followed in 1865 which I believe was the year of the 13th Amendment the emancipation of slavery the slave trade came to an end in this country and I'm so thankful it did and I'll just show you my hand if that is what the Civil War was all about then thank God for the Civil War for breaking that awful activity of slavery as it was carried out in this country. I will also just throw this out there that not all of those who had slaves in their employment were mean to them or wrong to them or harmful to them or ungodly to them unless you conclude that that relationship of employer-employee is wrong. And I'm afraid that we're moving into a generation today where there is a mindset that there, is no su there should be no such thing as employer-employee, that we should all be employers, that we should all be equal. There should be no this position and this position. There should be no submission to those who are in authority over us. And brethren, that's an ungodly and unbiblical conclusion to draw. Do not, in your attempt to malign, unbiblical, ungodly slavery, go to the other ditch of saying there is no distinction among human beings in the area of employment and other relationships. But Paul is here addressing Christians living in a very imperfect world, as we do in, in our own day. But the gospel, which liberates sinners from the bondage of sin, will affect change to the ungodly systems in society, including slavery, as the gospel gains inroads into our own hearts and minds and lives and bleeds forth into the culture through our choices as God's people. And cultures will change. While there is no perfect economic or social system in this world, the gospel guides the kingdom of God to live according to His righteous standards with the Spirit of Christ shaping our attitudes and our relationships. And so Paul, interesting how the language of Christianity goes, the bond servant of Jesus Christ. That's the very same word that he uses here of master-servant relationship. Paul was a bondservant. Paul was a slave of Jesus Christ. But a willing slave because God had changed his will. God had given him a, a new heart and his relationship to God had changed. But he, the Apostle Paul, never 
oppressed saints to revolt against a grossly flawed system like Rome. Are you hearing me when I say that? Because there are some Christians today who believe that we should be revolting against governments. The scriptures never press us in that direction as citizens of the kingdom of God in this world. In fact, he, the Apostle Paul, under Christ, presses saints, presses believers to live like the slaves of Jesus Christ that we are, whether we be bond or whether we be free in relationship to humans. We are bond slaves of Jesus Christ. I want to read 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I believe this will help. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 20. Another passage which speaks of this idea of who you might be in your culture. In that culture then, many of the employees being actually called servants, whether it be household servants or whether it be some other form of bondage relationship, slavery. Verse 20, let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called. That is... When God calls you to Himself, when God saves you, remain as you are. Are you called being a servant? That's the word, slave. Are you called being a servant? Care not for it. But if you are able, if you may be made free, if you're able to be free, use it rather, use that freedom. In other words, if the system you are in allows you to gain your freedom, then gain it. But if it doesn't, Paul doesn't say rebel against it. He says submit yourself. For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. That's who you are. You're the Lord's free man. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. So if the Lord calls you, it doesn't matter whether you are free or whether you're bond. Whether you're born a free man or whether you're born into slavery. Which by the way, historically much of slavery was by way of birth. If you were born to a slave, you became a slave. Paul says, the fact is, it doesn't matter whether you were born free or born a slave. If you're in Christ... You're, you're, you're on the same level. You're free. Free in Christ. And may I just add, if you're a free man that is born in some sort of freedom, and yet you're in bondage to sin, you're in the worst kind of bondage any person can be in. And Paul says, you are bought with a price. Be not you the servants of men. The governing principle in your life should not be your relationship to other human beings. The governing principle in your life should be your relationship to God in Christ. Have you been bought with a price? Have you been redeemed? Have you been delivered from the bondage to sin? Have you been delivered from your bondage to that old master, Satan himself? Have you been set free from your bondage to the world and the world system? Have you experienced that level of freedom? then care not, care not for the relationship that you may or may not have on a human level. And we could expand that to apply to a lot of relationships. You're a free person. And so, brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. So back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. While we do not live under the yoke of slavery, there is still a master-servant type relationship in employment. And by the way, if you were going to build a doctrine of proper employment, what scriptures would you go to? If you were going to build a doctrine of Christian employment, what scriptures would you go to? You would go to scriptures like this. Because that's the point that is being made. We need to live in these relationships in our lives in a way that commends the gospel. So if you are in a relationship with an unbelieving master, employer, a boss, what are you to do? 
What is to be your attitude? Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. Esteem them. Honor them. Respect them. That's to be shown to them. You say, well, I will if they deserve it. That's not what Paul says. In fact, Peter adds this over in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says in verse 18, servants, and here he's referring to household servants. It's not the same word slave here, but it's that household servitude that slaves experienced. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, not only to the good and gentle, not only to the good and gentle boss, not only to that boss who really treats you right and treats you fairly, not to that boss who gives you accolades and pumps you up and tells you what a great worker you are, but that boss who's presumptuous, that boss who doesn't seem to even care about you, but also to the froward, he says, to the, to the perverse, to the harsh, is what that word means. To the one who may belittle you, who may say awful things about you, or even to you. He says, for this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience toward God and your grief, suffering wrongfully. And he's talking here in the context of your employment, of what you're doing. And the attitude of your employer to you. Going back to Paul's words, he says, count your own masters. What should you do? You should count your own masters worthy of all honor. In other words, do you hear what he's saying? Count them. It's, it's your responsibility to think this way toward your master. It's not your master's responsibility to earn this from you. It's not your master's responsibility to make sure he treats you in such a way that you can do this. It's your responsibility, dear Christian, dear spirit-filled believer, dear citizen of the kingdom of God, you understand there's something different about you. And you are to demonstrate this. You're to count your own masters worthy of all honor. It's an attitude that you choose. It's an attitude that you cultivate toward your boss, toward your employer. And so the one in authority in your employment is not to be deemed worthy of all honor because you like him or that you agree with him or because you would do things the way he does, but because you are the servant and he is the master. Bottom line, you are the servant, he is the master. There's a relationship there of submission to one who has authority over you. Your employer, your boss, your boss should sense your honor and esteem. Does he? I mean, are you thinking about your employment? Are you thinking about your employer? Are you thinking about your attitude? I mean, most of you are going to wake up tomorrow and go to work. And I suppose we could apply this at home to those who are stay-at-home. Wives, mothers, you are under authority. What does he think of you? Do you honor? Bible, you, that's a whole other message, but it's related. You're to honor those who have authority over you. Does he sense that? Men? who are daily going out, laboring under someone else, do they sense that? You're, you say, I'm the king of my castle. I do what I want. I don't honor anybody. I, honor, I only honor the Lord. No, you are not honoring the Lord if you do not honor your master. Period. No matter what, it doesn't matter what you think. No matter where your mind goes, if you are not honoring your master, you're not honoring the Lord. Your goal in showing honor and, and and we could go to other places in scripture and show what the work ethic looks like Ephesians chapter 6 for example I, I'm not going to spend much time here because I don't have much time to spend on it but uh, Ephesians 6 listen to this a kindred passage servants verse 5 be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh 
with fear and trembling. Why is that? Fear and trembling. Why is that? Fear and trembling of your master? I don't think so. It's because you understand who you represent. You understand what's going on in this world. You understand what kingdom you represent, what, what master you really work for. You look at what he says. In singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleasers. You're not doing what you do only when your boss has his eye on you. Because you know what? Your boss always has his eye on you. Who's your boss? I mean, I know we're using earthly language here, but the Scriptures do use that language. Christ. Verse 6, But as the servants, the slaves, there's our word again, of Christ doing the will of God from the heart, not just externally. This is an internal thing. This is what you're... This is being worked out from inside of you with good will doing service. As to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whatsoever good thing any man does, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. And then he speaks to those who are free here in verse 9. You masters, you're the free ones. Do the same things. You've got a responsibility. You're an employer. You're equally accountable and responsible, aren't you, to the Lord? You have a master as well. That's what he says. Forbearing, threatening. Don't threaten that employee. Don't treat them like chattel, like they're, you know, you're the owner. You don't own them. God is their creator, not you. Knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect of persons with him, and you will give an account of how you have treated those who are under your authority. Your goal in showing honor to your unbelieving employer boss is what? What's the goal? That the name of God, back to our text, that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed. I'm afraid that the goal too many times for employ of, between the employer excuse me, the employee and the employer is what, what is in it for me. True? I mean, after all, you have a review, don't you? you have, your employer reviews. You, you, you know, you have that appointed time and, you, and you're hoping for a good review. Why are you hoping for a good review? Well, you want more money in your paycheck, don't you? Is that Why? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that fringe benefit. But I'm asking, what's motivating you, Christian? This is Christian work ethic here. What is motivating you? What should be motivating It should cause your heart grief if in the review of your employer, he points out something about your employment that is an honest evaluation and it comes short. Whether it be an attitude or action. Oh, there are unjust reviews. I understand that. There are criticisms that come that aren't warranted. I get that. We're a, that that's all part of the package of working in a world, in a relationship with the unbelieving world. And under servitude to an unbelieving master. But what should be motivating us is that we do nothing and say nothing and present no attitude that's going to bring blasphemy to the name of God and His doctrine. That which you say, you believe. He who you say is your Lord and God, Jesus Christ. Titus echoes this in Titus chapter 2 and verse 9. Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity. Why? Why are you saying this, Paul? In order that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior and all things. You're wearing the gospel. You're wearing the name of God. You wear Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. As you labor. 
as you work. Too many Christians give too many reasons for unbelieving employers to blaspheme or speak evil of God and His doctrine. Oh, be careful. Does this mean that you can never leave an employer? Does this mean that you can never speak? No, it doesn't mean that. Our system allows for this, for one. But secondly, even the Scriptures indicate this. I read it in 1 Corinthians 7, where he says, Are you called? Being a servant, care not for it. But if thou mayest, if you are able to be made free, go ahead. Get your freedom. If you're able to leave your employment and go to another employment that's more suitable, you're free to do that. But do it with the right attitude. Do it with the right spirit. Do it in a way that you're more concerned not about yourself. You're more con not about your own rights, your own comfort, your own advancement. But you're more concerned about the how you represent the name of God and His doctrine as you do what you do in relationship to your employer. You ever blown up at your employer? Or employer blown up, blown up your, at your employee? But here he's talking about employees. Have you ever blown up at your employer and said, and, and, and your response and your spirit was, that felt so good. He had it coming. Is that godly? I would say if that's happened with you, you need to have another appointment with your employer. And you need to confess. And you say, you know, that was not representative of the Christ that I know and love and serve. Because he, when he was reviled, he didn't revile back. He didn't open his mouth. I shouldn't have spoken to you the way I did. Please forgive me. Now having said that, I believe there's some things here in my relationship at this work that aren't working out well. And I think I'm going to have to seek another employment relationship. That's a godly way to deal with something right there. There's nothing out of line there. I'm just saying to you, prayerfully, prayerfully consider how you portray yourself in your employment situation that the name of God and His doctrine be not blasphemed, reproached, reviled because of your poor testimony. Verse 2, if you have, this will be quick, but if you have a believing master, a, a believing employer, a believing boss, what an incredible blessing that is. Uh, an ama that doesn't happen very often in this world, does it? But if you have that, consider yourself blessed but do not think improperly. Paul says, they that have believing masters, let them not despise them. Don't, don't, don't think less of that relationship. You owe them honor just like you owe the unbelieving master honor. In fact, I think Paul is arguing more so. More so. Because they are brethren. You have a different relationship with them. If an unbelieving boss is to be honored, how much more a believing one? The very fact that your boss is a brother in Christ. Phenomenal. That, I could, can you imagine going, some of you do that, I guess, I, you know, at some of the employment here. You know, maybe you have that. But can, that that's just like a, a dream come true kind of situation, isn't it? To go every day into work and your boss says, hey, come on, let's pray together before the day begins. It, wouldn't that be amazing to have that kind of relationship? See, that doesn't liberate you to do as you please and not listen to that boss. The fact of the matter is, it ought to stir you up. Let them not despise them. Indicates that it was being done here in Ephesus. He says, don't let this happen. Listen, I've, it's come to my attention that there are some of you who are laboring under a master and you've sort of You've sort of taken this spirit of, hey, we're all equal. In Christ, we're all equal. 
And so if we're one in Christ, there's no longer this bond or free thing. And so I'm no longer under authority. You're no longer my boss. Christ is my boss. And I'm going to listen to Him, not you kind of a spirit. We're equal. Being in Christ does not erase relational distinctions among brethren. There is still husband and wife. Right? There is still elders and the church, relationship, authority, submission, civil authorities, and people. Are they better? No, they're not better then. But under Christ, we've been given relationships. There are leaders, and there are those who are submitting themselves to that leadership. And so it is with employer and employee relationships. So being in Christ together... And viewing a believing boss as in Christ with you should enhance your sensitivity. And he, and, he, and he draws a strong contrast here in verse 2 when he says, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them because they are brethren, but, but rather do them service because they are faithful. At, because of who they are in Christ. Because of who you know they are in Christ. Give of yourself in a more, even more sensitive way in this relationship that Christ might be honored. That others that are looking on know. You know, this can happen in an employer-employee relationship where people, unbelieving employees in a business can look at that Christian that is also a fellow employee, and they see the relationship to the believing employer, and you know what can happen. Oh, got favoritism going on here, right? Oh, that's why you're slacking off. Because you know he ain't going to fire you. You know he ain't going to do nothing to you, because you're his brother in Christ. You hear the reproach going on there? No, the fact of the matter is, you ought to be leading the ranks in the employment. You ought to be the one who is, uh, who's doing as much as your skill level allows you to do. And maybe your skill level will not allow you to be better than an unbelieving partner. But I'll tell you what you have in Christ and the spirit you have from Christ can allow your spirit to far exceed your unbelieving co-worker. So that when you do what you do, he knows he's doing the best he can. He's given all he has. He's going beyond the call of duty. And in your heart, you know part of that is you want to honor your employer that you know is a believer. And you want the name of Christ exalted in that work environment and that relationship. You notice what he says here. But rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved, partakers of the benefit. What's he saying there? partakers of the benefit. I believe what he's saying, and there's some discussion if you go read the commentators, there's some discussion here about exactly what is being said. But it, it looks like what he's saying is, is that the master is a partaker of the benefit of having a believing employee. That is, the employer benefits from the service of the believing employee. They are there's a, there's a reciprocal relationship going on here. Go over to Philemon. Here's an example. Philemon. Just before Hebrews. Pick up the reading in, in verse 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus. He's writing this letter to Philemon, who was a... He had slave employees. It's almost hard for me to say slave owners. But he had slaves. He had servants. And, and Onesimus was one of those. And Onesimus had, he had split. Went to Rome. And while he was in Rome, came, came into contact with Paul. All that was designed by God, you know. And in that supposed temporary freedom from servitude to, uh, to Philemon, Onesimus met true freedom in Christ and became a bond slave to Christ. And so Paul is writing back to Philemon about Onesimus. 
He says, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. Sounds like Onesimus was probably not a very good employee. Whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I, have, whom I would have retained with me. I would have kept him. I wanted to keep him. But I knew it wasn't right. Not under the system of that day. It wasn't right. That in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Verse 14. But without thy mind, in other words, without your consent, would I do nothing. That thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season from Philemon to Paul in Rome, that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant. Not just an employee, but more than an employee. A brother Beloved, that's the same language that Paul uses there in 1 Timothy, of the Master. Especially to me, but now much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. You see what's going on there? When someone comes into a relationship with Jesus Christ by the regen regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, you become a bondservant to Jesus Christ. It changes your relationship with everyone. And here we're talking about employment. It changes your relationship to your employer. And if it's a believing employer, it doesn't free you. It emboldens you. It enables you to give of yourself in a far greater way than you ever gave yourself before in service to your employer. The instruction that Paul is giving here is not a side issue in the Christian life. I, I, I'm concerned at times it seems to me like there's a disconnect. A real disconnect in the minds of people who profess to be Christians between what they say to be their understanding of the gospel and the impact of that gospel in their lives. And I am saying to you on the basis of what we're reading here in 1 Timothy chapter 6 that if the gospel is not affecting you in your relationship to those who have the authority over you, and here specifically in your employee-employer relationship and employer-to-employee relationship, then the gospel is not having the impact it was intended to have. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. You don't work on your own terms. You don't labor with your own agenda. You labor as a servant of Christ in service to those that you're employed to. Did you hear what Paul said there at the end of verse 2? What does he say? These things teach and exhort. I just want to hear gospel messages. These things and by that, by the way, what we're talking about this morning is the gospel. It's the outworking of the gospel, not the gospel. It's the outworking of the gospel. But he says, these things teach and exhort, instruct them and exhort them. And by the way, that's a present tense active verb, which means keep doing it. Not just once in a 10-year church ministry, continually do these things. Because it needs to be spoken continually to remind ourselves of who we are in this world. The work ethic of Christians ought to set us apart from the world. Not simply that we might be filled with spiritual pride. But that others might, Jesus said this, see our good works and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. 
And so, when you get passed over for that promotion at work, and you keep working as diligently or more, more so than you ever did before, what does that say? What do the other employees say? Are you crazy? Don't you know you deserve that promotion? Don't you know you should have been picked? That's the murmuring that goes on in the workplace, isn't it? And you say, whether that's so or not, I'll leave that for others to decide. But this much I know, I serve the Lord Jesus. I serve the Lord God. And I'm going to keep working like I know He wants me to work with the attitude I know He wants me to have. Your Father has just been glorified. Do you need to evaluate your attitude towards your employer? Does he know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? Is it evident? Not just because you leave tracks around the workplace, but because of your life, because of what your, your attitude and the way you engage the things that come out of your mouth. What does your attitude and work ethic say? to your employer and to others in your place of employment. This is Christianity where the rubber meets the road. I hope the rubber's meeting the road in your life and my life. And that our God and His doctrine is being lived out, not just spoken, lived out in this world. Uphold the name of God well in the workplace. Right. Father, we do need help here.